Okay, hey everybody, Techie101 back again. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't really have an intro segment this week, so I'm just gonna try on a bunch of funny hats. Is that cool with you? All right, it's cool with me. All right, so we, uh, we have Luffy's hat, we have the straw hat, which, you know, not really that goofy, but it's a little goofy, you know, the main character of the series going around with you at the straw hat. I mean, there's a little bit of, of hilarity involved with this. That's a little bit there. Uh, what else do we got? We got, um, we got a tricorn hat. We got a tricorn hat. I usually wear this as William in One Piece D&D. I really wanted a bicorn hat, but it's kind of hard to find a bicorn hat. Tricorn hats all over the place. All right, what else do we got? Uh, we got the funny chicken hat. That's a fun one. Funny chicken hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know if this counts as a hat, but Iron Man helmet. Okay. Yes, I shall just do the video like this. Hello, everybody. I am Iron Teching. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, kind of applicable for how this chapter is going to start. This will be One Piece, chapter 1092 review, titled The Rampage Incident of Tyrant Kuma in the Holy Land. That'll be fun to try to fit that all on screen. I don't know. I might have to do a couple of lines on that one. Okay, so we start off. We have a cover page. We got uh, Jinbei hanging out with a bunch of remoras. Like, remoras, the fish that, like, latch on with the suckers on other fish. Um, the Remoraid, Pokemon from Gen 2. You know, you know Remoraid? I like Remoraid. He's cool. He turns into an octopus. Anyway, Remoraid is a remora, and he'll cling to, like, Mantine and, like, other Pokemon that are aquatic and larger than him. So that, that's neat. So Jinbei is making a bunch of friends. Remoras are actually really cool. They um they cling to not just other sea, you know, creatures like marine life, but they'll also cling to like divers when they go down as well. So that's kind of cool. But uh yeah, continuing well not right where we left off because we were at Egghead. We're we're really moving around the world a lot, but it, it really makes sense when you really think about it. So we're opening up in Marijua, as Kuma has finally reached the top, okay? So Kuma landed at the Red Port. He was originally, well, he was originally at Marijua as a slave, as PX0, and then the revolutionaries brought him to Kamabaka Kingdom in Paradise, and then as, like, a as everything was going on in Egghead, it seemed to, like, activate something in his memory banks or something, and he's just like, yeah, wait, oh, hold on, let me do a thing. Yeah. You know, Tyrant Kuma protocol need to be with my daughter. I will go to her. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's good there. We, we could do that. All right, so <clears throat> you think Tony Stark installed like some kind of like air freshener in there or something? It's just, you know, you're inside of a giant iron suit. It's got to just stink after a while. You think there'd have to be like a little bit of a, it's like Jarvis initiates, you know, sea breeze. Oh, delicious. Okay. So, um, Kuma was climbing up the red line. They were trying to shoot him down from red port, but that didn't work out too well. In fact, I think he did fall once, but then he just started climbing again. He's very tenacious, if nothing else, okay? So we finally see him arriving at the top, okay? Now, even though Kuma was able to climb the entire red line, that also kind of gave the people at Marijua time to, like, mobilize, like, the government getting everybody in order. I am shocked that the God's Knights haven't arrived yet, okay? Are you not shocked? Granted, you see some other people being like the Vanguard first, and when when, when we see who is there, it all kind of comes into line. But it really makes me question, like, okay, the function of the God's Knights it, it really has to be, like, something insane. Like, Agorose or Eam themselves have to be almost ready to get killed before one of the God's Knights mobilizes, okay? So, we see these the same angle. Remember when you arrive in Marijua from the Red Port on Paradise side. Castle Pangea is on your left, and then you have the Travel Vators in the center, and there's that artificial forest, and then on the right, um, you know, is the city, is the Celestial Dragon City, okay? So, we see a big explosion occurring right in the center, right in that, like, where the travel vator is. So, Castle Pangea is immediately to the left, and the city is immediately to the right. And so, I guess, you know, Kuma arrived at the top, and he made it, like, a little bit into the city. Like, I don't know, if I was, like, part of security detail, like, if I was Kong, Kong should also be hanging out here, too. So, there's a lot of heavy hitters, right? I would just be like, all right, wait until Kuma reaches the top, and he gets to the top, and he's like, <laughs> and then just have somebody really strong like Kong or one of the God's Knights or even Cypherpool Zero working together could probably do this and just... 
boom, just kick him off the side of the red line again. Um, but no, it, it seems like they waited a little while for him to get, like, in the city. Like, he's pretty damn close to the Celestial Dragon City. He's, like, right next to the front gates of Castle Pangea when this explosion's happening. So, we see, uh, we see the pinheaded guards. We see the guards, just the normal guards of the castle that have the giant cone heads. And he's like, who you calling a pinhead? Well, anyway, they're there, and they're, like, trying to, like, wrangle Kuma with a bunch of chains. Yeah, like, that's gonna work. The former warlord, former tyrant Kuma, user of the pawpaw fruit and current, like, terminator, is gonna be stopped by a bunch of, like, random guards with chains. And just like, he's too strong! We can't hold him back! It's like, I, I would, I would love to be one of the guards there, and I would just be sitting there and just like, why did they order us to even attempt this? <laughs> you know, like, what? They, Kong couldn't have come out in one of the God's Knights, you know, where's Akainu? Oh, there's Akainu. So, Akainu is here, which I like to think, you know, the, the reason the God's Knights maybe never mobilized, in my opinion, is because, like, unless there was ever a direct threat to Marijois, because not, the, the admirals aren't always hanging out at Marijois, right? They'll go there sometimes, especially the fleet admiral for, like, meetings with the Gorosei and stuff. But, like, I always assumed the reason the God's Knights were there were to protect Castle Pangea and Marijois in general if there was ever an attack, like an onslaught attack, right? You know, it's just like, like, oh, the admirals don't have time to get there. They're down in Marine HQ. They have to get all the way up the red port and red line. Uh, we need a defense force right here and now. Now, like I said though, it did take Kuma probably a while to reach the top of the red line, okay? It, this wasn't something that was accomplished in just a matter of like maybe a couple hours. Th this might have taken a while. By the way, um, this is occurring yesterday. So we're at Egghead right now the, and the day before this is happening. So Kuma might be actually heading toward Egghead. That makes the most sense. He doesn't seem to be hanging around in Marijuana because it is explained that Kuma is able to send anybody, you know, three days and three nights anywhere in the world. That's how it was, like, originally explained by Sentomaru. But that might have not have been completely accurate. The red line is really tall, so Kuma went from Kamabaka rocketing toward the red line. If it was feasible for Kuma to use his Devil Fruit power to just whoop, like, just over the red line, he would have done that. He wouldn't have had to stop at the red port and climb the whole damn wall. So there, do, there does seem to be, like, a range with the Paw Paw Fruit when you're doing that, okay? And it does make sense, because, um, um, during Sabaody, when Kuma was sending all the Straw Hats to various locations, where does he send them? Well, he sends the majority of them to other islands in the Grand Line. He sends Frankie to Baljamore, that was in the Grand Line. Usopp got sent to the Boeing Islands, the Stomach Baron Archipelago little place, that was in the Grand Line. Nami was sent to Weatheria, which was a Sky Island, but it was still in the perimeter of the Grand Line, of Paradise Side. Uh, the two Straw Hats that he did not send to the Grand Line were Robin and Chopper. Robin was sent to Tequila Wolf in the East Blue, and Chopper was sent to the Torino Kingdom in the South Blue. Both blues that border the Grand Line, or the Paradise side of the Grand Line. He didn't send any of the Straw Hats to, like, the North Blue, or the West Blue, or New World, or anything like that. So maybe there is a, a distinctive limit with the Paw Fruit. You can't go over the Red Line exactly. And Kuma is like an unthinking robot that's acting like... I I'm thinking Vegapunk probably programmed something in him uh, to resonate, like, with Bonnie. Like, if Bonnie ever discovers the memory bubble or something, there's like a... a something like an override inside of his brain that no matter what his previous orders were given, no matter who it was, it doesn't matter if it was a Celestial Dragon or a Gorosei or Dragon or whoever, um, it's like, whenever Bonnie needs me, I must go to her, kind of thing, right? So, he's not, if, if he was able to go over the red line, he would have. He didn't, so that means he can't, okay? That's basically how that goes. So, um, this is occurring yesterday is my point. So, he might be already almost to Egghead. If he managed to get to the other side, not even go down the red line, but if he was able to go all the way to the other edge of the red line, and not even jump down, but then use the power, he could maybe go straight to Egghead in less than a day. So he might be arriving rather shortly, is, is my takeaway here, okay? But it's gonna be kind of difficult, because he's being wrangled by the guards right now, and he's like, yeah, Kuma's trying to go somewhere, we gotta stop him, alright? We see the Celestial Dragons there off to the side, and they're just, like, all complaining, and they're like, oh, please stop, he's, he's attacking us, he's injured some of us. Also, I ordered lobster last night, and I'm still waiting for it to arrive. What are we going to do with this food shortage? 
So, also referencing the, the food stores, the granaries and stuff that were destroyed by Sabo and the various Revolutionary Army commanders as part of their subterfuge operation of declaring war. Um, I also like to think that there is in fact some food left in the Celestial Dragon City, but it's like commoner food, right? It's just like, ah, oh, there's no food! It's like, well, you know, St. Charlos, we do have these can of green beans and uh, we have some frozen meals. Ah, oh, frozen canned food! I demand the finest lobster from the South Blue! If I can't have that, there's no point in living! I'll die of starvation! <laughs> you know, it's, it's that kind of shit, right? Okay. Well, anyway, um, um, yeah, so they're all off to the side kind of complaining and just like, somebody please stop that rogue! Okay, and so then you have Akainu arriving. Now, Akainu was stationed at Marine HQ, which is right on the other side of the red line uh, in the New World, so I'm assuming as soon as Kuma was climbing up, it's like, ah, uh, Kuma is, you know, he's not responding to any of our commands, he just seems to be attacking Marijua now. It's kind of a repeat of the uh, giant robot incident from 200 years ago. So I bet Akainu was like, all right, he had more than enough time to either use his Devil Fruit ability, because I'm sure he could do that. He can make, like, rocket thrusters or something and fly up. Or he might have been able to just go to the Red Port and go up the normal way. Either way, Akainu made it to Marijua, and he's the one that's stopping Kuma. So, I like to see Akainu in action. It's been a long time since we've ever seen Akainu really do anything. So this is cool. I'm just saying that, like... We could have seen Kong instead. We could have seen one of the God's Knights stop him. Um, I feel like there's other characters that could have been utilized here. But hey, Akainu, the Fleet Admiral of the Marines, showing up to defend Marijua, the city of the Celestial Dragons, and the Gorosei. I'm guessing he, he's the first line of defense. And then if he somehow is defeated, then Kong would step out and then he would fight. I mean, there is a chain of command here. I mean, if we're just going by that and that alone, it does go Akainu as the Fleet Admiral. Kong is the Commander-in-Chief then I guess the God's Knights, and then eventually Gorosei, and then Eames. So, there is an order of command here, alright? So, he steps out, and uh, he's like, Ah, hey, Kuma. What are you doing here, man? <laughs> it's like, we can't control you anymore. You're just a thoughtless, emotionless robot. Well... We can't have you coming up here and wrecking everything, so I'm gonna have to put you down. All right, now Akainu is a, he's a no-nonsense kind of guy, so he's not gonna try to like, sense your soul, Kuma, you know, whatever like that. He's gonna get to it. So, um, Kuma actually utilizes Ursus a shock to knock all of the pinheaded guards away, knocks them off of him, gets the chains off of him, right? And so he's there, and he's just starting to move, and Akainu's there, and he's just like, man, dude, we've had, we've had the revolutionary coming in here, burning the city down, destroying the food reserves, and now this guy, oh my god, we, we, it's too dangerous for you to be on the loose. I don't care where you're heading to, you're, you're going somewhere, you clearly have a mission, but I don't care. So he uses Hellhound. This was the technique that he utilized against uh, Whitebeard to destroy Whitebeard's mighty mustache. <laughs> it's the most, it's the strongest technique in One Piece, let me tell you right now. Okay, so in the, um, in the manga, he uses this technique to actually, like, it incinerates, melts off, like, half of Whitebeard's face. Not, not exactly half, like, what would you say? Like, a good 20%, a good 20% of Whitebeard's face was, like, melted off by this technique, right? Uh, Akainu just charges up his magma and just, like, palm thrusts, like, right into your face, okay? In the anime, they had to dial that down a bit, so it just destroyed his mustache. But the reaction was still the same from the crowd, like, no! I, I would imagine that same, like, not the white beard mustache that's his trademark you can't destroy the stash he infused the stash with so much armament hockey and Akainu was still able to destroy it all right I, you know Whitebeard doesn't even need to go to a hairdresser or a salon to maintain his stash you know he just wakes up in the morning and it's a little frazzled and Whitebeard just just flexes his face muscles and it just toop, it's like it's like putting a dent out in a car or whatever it just it just pops into place so Akainu uses the same technique on Kuma in pretty much the exact same way goes to attack straight for that. I mean, he's trying, I mean, same thing with Whitebeard as well with Kuma. Akainu was trying to melt his face off, okay? That, that was the whole idea. He was trying to, like, you know, hellhound and just, you know, hit the face dead on and just melt your head. And once you don't have a head anymore, well, 
Whitebeard and Kuma, I'm not sure. They might both still be able to function for a little while without a head. They're that badass. But um, same thing with Whitebeard. Kuma like moves at the last possible moment and Hellhound hits and it does melt off half of his face. So yeah, uh, you see the blood because the Passy Feast is, I, I mean, I compare them to Terminators because they kind of are, you know, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. So they are able to sweat and to bleed and all that kind of stuff. Um, now in the case with normal Passy Feast is they are Terminators. In the case with Kuma, he was a human first and then modified. So that blood might, in fact, be his own blood, um, but he was modified into a combat weapon here. And Akainu even mentions as much. He's just like, ah, oh, still seems like you got a little bit of blood in you. Well, I still gotta put you down. You know, I, I look at it from the perspective that a Akainu is not... He's the fleet admiral, right? But he's not well versed in like engineering or technology, right? This is still very much new technology in the One Piece world to have robots walking around and stuff. So I, I wanted to bring that up because, you know, Akainu mentions, hey, you're still bleeding. Well, from Akainu's perspective, a living person would bleed, right? You know, that's like, well, like having blood to shed is an example of being a living being, being a human being, right? And he doesn't like, you know, robots and cyborgs and androids and all that nonsense. I'm not saying it would stay a Kainu's hand or anything, but it's just like a Kainu's like, yeah, you're no longer a living being, Kuma. You're just a thoughtless, emotionless robot and nothing else, right? All of your humanity was taken from you. So when he melts Kuma's face and he sees blood, Akainu might for a moment be like, all right, huh, you could still bleed. It's almost like Akainu was like, ah, I didn't expect a like an emotionless robot to bleed, but you can. Okay, well, whatever. It's, once again, it's not going to be compassion or anything from a Kainu that's going to stay his hand. It's maybe just an observation that he made. So, Kuma is actually not interested in fighting a Kainu, like who would be? Well, <laughs> Sabo for one, Luffy for second, but Kuma just tries to book it. He tries to run right past a Kainu, and a Kainu's just like, where are you going? Get over here! And so, a Kainu rockets up into the air and just launches a giant giant uh, bombardment of like meteors and like like molten slag at Kuma. Uh, he doesn't name the attack, but there is a move that's I bookmarked it. It's very similar. Ryusei, uh, Ryusei Kazan. Okay, it's a uh, meteor volcano, meteorite volcano. Kind of. All right, yeah, sure. So it's the attack he uses to just like bombard it. It melts a lot of the ice uh, back at Marine Fort. He uses that technique, right? It's just a meteor storm. Okay, it's basically what it is, right? So he uses that on Kuma, and it's hitting Kuma all over himself. It's hitting him in the back and his arm and we have a close-up of one of the meteors striking Kuma right in the foot, all right? And you get the impression that basically a Kainu melted off or just blew off one of uh, Kuma's feet, okay? And so then, right at that moment where he's like about to fall over, he pops. He uses the uh, the, the, the pawpaw fruit to like warp himself away in a, in a direction, okay? And a Kainu is there smoking his cigar and he has a flashback to when he captured Bonnie. All right, so remember way back, there was right before the time skip when we see what all the different supernovas were doing in the New World. Uh, Law decided to stay behind, of course. The Straw Hats were training, but all the other uh, supernovas were trying to get to the New World. And you saw Bonnie and her crew, back in the day when she had her crew, captured by Blackbeard, who were attempting to like hand her over uh, to the Marines. But then Akainu was showing up, and he's like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. So Blackbeard left, Ak Akainu arrived, captured Bonnie's crew. Bonnie managed to escape from that, like uh, got away in on like en route back to Marine Ford or Impel Down or whatever. She got away. Her crew was still captured though. And so we get a little bit of the remainder of that conversation where Akainu was just like, uh, you know, you could cry all you want, but Kuma's already gone, Bonnie. He was already changed into a combat weapon of his own free will by Dr. Vegapunk. Um, you know, you know, he's no longer the Kuma you'll know, and he'll never go back to the way he was. And Bonnie is just like, liar, there's no way he would have done that. So right there is kind of the origin point from, uh, wow, Akainu is really good at that now that I'm thinking about it. Akainu is really good at turning allies on, on, on other allies. Have you noticed this? Like, really, a kind of, it happened with Squardo at Marineford, where Squardo rolls up, and, you know, he's just like, I'm an ally of Whitebeard, and then, like, Akainu arrives, and Squardo, for one thing, actually listens to what Akainu says, and then Squardo, after, like, listening to Akainu for, Akainu for a couple of minutes, is just like, you know what? I should stab Pops in the back! All right! You know, actually stabs him in the front. You know, but it's just weird. And now here it is. It kind of is just like, yeah, Bonnie, I'm sorry, but 
Vegapunk turned Kuma into a uh, cyborg. Uh, it was his own free will. And, you know, Bonnie's like, liar! It must have been Vegapunk! And just like... <laughs> okay, quit listening to Akainu, please. He's the fleet out. It's not a guy you should be listening to if you're a pirate, you know what I mean? He's gonna try to mess with you, but all right. So anyway, that, that's the origin of that. That's the rest of that conversation that uh, we need to know about. So uh, Kuma vanishes. He just blips out of existence. All the other uh, Tenrobito that are hanging around are like now chastising Akainu. And just like, oh, don't tell me you let him get away again, you fool! You know, it's just like, uh, I don't know, man. So Akainu's there. Um, like, it's like, you're, you're just a puppet now, Kuma. You've lost everything. Your body, your will, your mind. Where are you heading off to? So Akainu just kind of looks up to the blue sky with the clouds. It's, it's kind of like an emotional moment where he's just like, <sighs> smoking his cigar. He's like, a man with no will of his own. Where are you going, Kuma? Where are you going? And then the tender Beto were like, what are you doing? Go after him! <laughs> Just look at, it's like, hey, I'm, not, I'm on the clock. I'm going over here. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm trying to look at the direction to where Kuma blipped off. And it seemed like, see, Castle Pangea is still, like, on the left. So, you know, it, it seems like Kuma went back the way he came in. Right? But it doesn't really matter because once I guess he gets over the red line and then he uses the pawpaw fruit, he can just whoop, you know, pull a U-turn and pull a Yui or whatever. Like like he's clearly trying to get over the red line. Marijua was clearly not his primary target if he blipped away. He was clearly trying to get over the red line. Okay, maybe Maybe the Marijua was his primary target and he was trying to get into Castle Pangea, so he maybe he went to the castle instead. But Akainu really has no sense of urgency here. Akainu doesn't seem to be like, he blipped. Oh, he's trying to get into the castle. I gotta stop. Like, it doesn't seem to be anything like that. Uh, or maybe Akainu's like, yeah, he's heading into the castle. That means it's the God's Knight's territory. You know, maybe, but it, I don't think that's the case. It really seemed like Akainu is just kind of like, all right, I don't sense him anymore. He's gone. He, he went over the red line. He's heading into the new world. I have no idea where he's going. He has no will of his own. He has no memories. So where could he possibly be going, right? Once again, Akainu maybe not fully caught up to the idea that maybe Vegapunk programmed a specific, like, routine, like a subroutine or something inside of Kuma. Uh, I talk about subroutines. Like, I don't know shit about computers or software programming. He, he programmed a special chip inside of him. So it's like, go here if this happens, all right? So, you know, that might be the situation there. So, um... We are now cutting back to Egghead, right? And uh, the Marine blockade is doing really well now that the Mark III's are on their side. The Mark III's take down all of the mechanized sea beasts. They're all defeated. So that means the Marines, the actual major force of the Marines, can now land on the island and take it over. So they've arrived, they arrived at the fabrication sphere, and they're beginning to occupy the island, okay? So that's going on down below. So there's really no way... I mean, like, I don't think... They were never going to escape from the regular ports, but that's definitely out now, right? Well, anyway, going back up to the lab, Sphere. We now have Admiral Kizaru fighting against Luffy. And like I said, I made a video about this last week. Luffy didn't jump to Gear 5th right away. Keep in mind, Gear 5th does burn out a lot of energy. We saw that when he fought against Luchi, and he was kind of drained after that. We saw it with Kaido. So Luffy's used the technique at least twice now. He's used it again, well, technically three times. He used it initially against Kaido, and then it wore off, and then he had to jumpstart his heart again, so that was two. Um, maybe he tried using it after just to test it to see if he could go into it again maybe he did maybe he didn't not sure but the next time we canonically see him use it is when he fights against Luchi so he's used it three times and he's pretty winded after it it, it, it ends each time so maybe Luffy is aware of this now and he's like okay I gotta be careful when using that Awakening. I gotta be careful when using Gear 5th. I'm the most free I've ever been, and I'm the happiest I've ever been, and I can jump around, and it's great. Uh, but I, I, I have to kind of restrain myself, because if it runs out, then I'm kind of screwed here. So um, he's using Gear 4th Snake Man, which is the best 
gear forth mode to use against Kizaru. It is the fastest. Um, kind of reminiscent of the time at Marine Ford when Luffy tried to use gear second to get by the admirals and Kizaru just kicked him in the face. So just like, you're too slow, Straw Hat. So Luffy's trying to up it a little bit. He'll go into Snake Man and he's clashing with Kizaru here. Kizaru says, he's like, ah, you certainly are the man that defeated Kaido. You're formidable for sure, but why is a pirate like you protecting Vegapunk to begin with? And Luffy, of course, you know, he's just like, hey, I don't know about that, but what are you guys trying to fight and kill old man Apple for? He's a good man. He's got an apple for a head, right? Luffy's not going to sit down and have like a whole philosophical, like, why are we doing what we're doing? Ah, we're just cogs in the machine. You know what it is? No. It's just like, you know, you're trying to kill old man Apple. I'm going to stop you, okay? So he's launching a barrage of like Jet Kovrians at uh, Kizaru. Kizaru's blocking the attacks and he's using his light and it, it, it really doesn't seem like Kizaru's really exerting himself all that much. Luffy seems to be really putting in the effort. He's really just trying to hit him and Kizaru's just kind of pulling up his arms with light and he's just just like, ah, you are certainly formidable. I can, yes, oh yes, I can see the level of power here. That uh, definitely defeated Kaido, you know, but it doesn't really seem like Kido's, uh, Kizaru is really, um, you know, exerting himself to the point of exhaustion or anything. So, um, finally, Kizaru just, like, zips away, <laughs> which is something I assumed he could do, you know, he could just move, like, really fast, you know, he's made of light after all, so Luffy's trying to pummel him, and Kizaru just zips, and when I say zips away, I don't mean just, like, ten feet in the air, I mean, he's, like, like, a couple miles or kilometers away from Egghead, he's like, here's the island, here's the Labo phase, Kizaru just zip, just, like, all the way over here, and like that, because he's fast, right, and so he zips away, and he does kind of respond to Luffy's question. Luffy asks him, why do you want to kill Vegapunk? Kizaru's like, kill him? I don't want to kill him. Uh, I've known Vegapunk for a long time, so please don't get in my way, Straw Hat. Don't make this any harder than it has to be. And so then he, you know, zips away, a couple miles away, and then he disassembles his whole body into light, and he rockets back to the Labosphere, okay? Acceleration equals power! I think. I don't know. I mean, that's what Kizaru says. It, it, it's reminiscent of the line he used against Hawkins when he meets Hawkins at Sabote. He's like, speed is weight. Have you ever been kicked at the speed of light? Boom! And then kicks Hawkins into the side of a wall. So here, it's acceleration is power. All right. Hold on a moment. Let me try to remember physics class here. This is going to be a... All right. So acceleration. I think the formula for that is... Um, it's velocity and it's time, right? You got velocity. I know force is, okay, mass times acceleration equals force. I think that's right. Mass and acceleration equal force. I think the formula for acceleration is velocity and time, or the vo two velocities and then divided over time. Something like that. I don't know. Not a physics major, clearly. But he, he's really powerful. He's really fast, all right? So he disassembles his whole body and then just shoots right back to Egghead and kicks Luffy square on, knocks him right through Vega Force 1, destroying the robot. Like, the robot gets hit right here, and then, like, the leg and the upper half of the body are just destroyed like a, like a bomb just hit it and Luffy's still going and he slams into the frontier dome and he gets nuked by that thing and he goes down like literally down like he falls down alright he gets hit into the frontier dome okay um thank god the sunny is okay because Vega Force 1 was carrying the sunny so the sunny's up here like this like hold on a moment I don't have the sunny but I do have the Mary um the Mary's been in better shape. The, the, the sail fell off. It's just, it, oh dear friend. <laughs> you know, okay. So, Vega Force 1 is like carrying the Sunny like this, and then Luffy hits it like right down here, and just, whoa! Oh no! It's falling apart! The bottom of the sea is a lonely place, Mary. All right. So, thank God the Sunny doesn't get destroyed. It lands on a, on a comfy little island cloud. So the Sunny's all right. It just kind of lands a little lopsided. Um, but the robot is not looking too well. Vegapunk, uh, uh, Kizaru has a flashback to when Vegapunk showed off the robot. Like, this is the giant robot that humanity has been dreaming about. 
This scene really brings back memories because as a Power Ranger fan, I've seen the Megazords wrecked more times than I could count. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always heartbreaking when you see the giant robots falling apart, right? You know, that's how you knew in Power Rangers that a villain means business, that, like, this was, like, one of the final bosses when they just go over and, like, grab the Megazord and, like, rip its arms off and the Rangers are like, no! You know, I was like, we gotta abandon ship! You know, I was like, that, that's how you knew it was on, okay? So, um... Vega Force One falls, it's in two pieces, but it's about to be in even more pieces because Lilith kind of hits the evac button and like ejects, and she's like, we gotta move and hit the core! <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. So Frankie and Bonnie and Lilith all bail out as Vega Force One like blows up, okay? Um, she doesn't actually say it hit the core or hit the, hit the boiler or something, but it exploded. So Kizuru hits something important. It hit the, the fuel cell or something, I don't know. But Lilith just jumps out of the thing and she's like, we gotta run, Buck, it's gonna blow! All right, and so they get out of there. Vega Force One explodes. So that's sad, robot's gone. Uh, the Sunny is like, Frankie's looking at the Sunny and it's kind of laying on its side. He's like, oh, is the Sunny okay? All right, holy crap, this is, this is, this heart palpitations. There's a lot going on here. A lot of stuff's blowing up, okay? Um, so now Luffy, Luffy got knocked away. He's like gone now. So it's like, okay, Kizaru's there and then Bonnie's there. And now I guess Kizaru, Bonnie, Frankie, Lilith fight. All right, let's see where it goes. Um, I actually kind of do want to see Frankie fight Kizaru. We don't get it in this chapter. He attempts to, but... You know, we'll see what happens. But Bonnie shows up now, and uh, Kizaru's like, Ah, you've grown so much, Bonnie. Kids these days sure grow up fast. See, here's the thing with that, and it's the other thing Jay Garcia mentioned a few chapters ago, where Jay Garcia was like, Ah, oh, Bonnie's just a little girl. Don't worry about her, right? And then Kizaru here is just like, You've grown up so much, Bonnie. So the implication is like, you know, is Bonnie like an actual little kid? that's using her time powers to be older, okay? But I, I still bring up the one issue with that where Bonnie mentioned that she was on Egghead before, before any of the Labo phase or the Fabrication phase was built. Like at the beginning of Vegapunk having the island, uh, she went there with Kuma when she was a little kid. Like, she has memories of that, okay? So, that was at least 20 years ago. Probably a little more than 20 years ago, but that was around 20 years ago or so that she was on the island with Kuma and met Vegapunk back then. So, that that still doesn't make any sense to me. I think they're just, like, being... I think they're just doing, like, oh, you're just a little brat, Bonnie, or whatever. You know, it's the same thing, like, when Doflamingo was fighting Luffy and Law and, and was calling them kids or brats or whatever. It's like, you know, you guys are just kids. You know, I'm a grown-up, and, you know, I'm, I've had enough of your bullshit. You know, that kind of crap, right? I, I still think it's something like that. I don't think Bonnie is, like, an actual little kid, because the timeline just doesn't... I, okay, time travel exists in One Piece. I understand that. But, like, this still doesn't make any sense, okay? Um... So, uh, Kizaru says that you have a grudge on Vegapunk, right? You know, well, uh, why are you, you know, I'm the one here. I was here to exterminate Vegapunk. So this should all be what, you know, you wanted this whole time, right? You had a grudge against him. I'm here to kill him. And so Bonnie is just like, my target has changed, right? And so then she uses a technique called trace death thrust, uh, trace death thrust. And her arms get like really long, like snake arms. You ever watch Hunter Hunter when, um, uh, uh, Kilawa uses the awakened snakes and he like dis like disconnects like disjoints his arms and like moves his arms around kind of reminds me of that um it's probably another technique that's similar to like the uh distorted future that she used when she became like super buff bonnie uh she has like access she might have awakened her fruit honestly and she has like access to different like parallel versions of her of herself so there's a version of her that gets super buff and there's a version of her that's a member of the long arm tribe. I, I don't know, but she's able to extend her arms. You know, Bonnie's ability gets weirder the more that you see of it. Um, she tries to attack Kizaru with that. Kizaru, of course, just zips, you know, to the left and just like, you know, the attack misses. You know, trying to flail your arms at Kizaru is not really going to do much, right? Um, so he's like, aside from my mission targets, please don't make me hurt people that I already know. It's, it's really hurtful for me, man. I already had to put down Sentamaru. I don't want to hurt you, too. So the whole time this is going on, Kizaru is... I don't want to say he's going to be swayed over to the other side, like, I don't want to do this, but, you know, Oda is making it a point to show that every time Kizaru does something, like when he destroyed Vega Force One, or when he, you know, uh, maybe killed Sentomaru, or at least, you know, knocked out Sentomaru, he has memories of, like, ah, oh, man... 
I don't want to have to do this. I really don't. But, all right. Ah, that was Vegapunk's robot that he built. That was a really cool thing. I really don't want to blow that thing up. Oh, well. <laughs> Kicks Luffy right into it. You know what I mean? So, it, it is adding a little bit of humanity to Kizaru, but I don't think it's going to coalesce into anything like Kizaru's going to like... All right, I, I, I can't do this anymore, guys. I'm going to quit the Marines and work with you guys now. I doubt that's where this is going, but he does have memories of all this, okay? So, um, Kizaru, he does, like, you know, he kicks Bonnie, I think. It's, it's kind of like, so Bonnie, like, tries to attack Kizaru. Kizaru zips over, you know, made a light, so Bonnie, like, falls, like, you know, right through where Kizaru used to be. And then Kizaru just kind of, like, back kicks Bonnie, like, you know, like, boom, and then gets sent flying, and it looks like Bonnie, the same thing happened with Luffy. Luffy got sent flying into the Frontier Dome. We're, we're gonna get confirmation on that at the end of the chapter. It looks like Bonnie also kind of got knocked into the Frontier Dome, except Bonnie's not made of rubber and doesn't have gear fifth, so I don't know how she's gonna survive this, but there's a massive explosion when she gets kicked by Kizaru, okay? So at this point, the only person left is Frankie. And so Frankie, you know, a superman knows what he's gotta do, right? And he's like, oh, damn you, Kizaru! All right, here we go! Radical beam! Oh, where'd you go? So, like, just like that, Kizaru just gone, all right? I would love to see Frankie versus Kizaru, but the thing is, Kizaru is just way too fast, okay? If you want to say Luffy could keep up with him, sure, but, like... Frankie is, like, canonically the slowest straw hat, all right? Like, he's big and clunky, like, you know, yeah, he could fire a laser, but he still has to line the laser up, he has to charge it. Kizaru could just, you know, fire him. So, I would love to see Frankie versus Kizaru, and this, the laser wouldn't have done anything. Even if he would have fired a radical beam right at Kizaru's face and hit him dead on, it would have done nothing. He would have just absorbed the power, and that would have been it. But anyway, um... We are now uh, cutting back to the uh, the lab. So, you know, Kizaru zips away, and Frankie's like, wait, where did he go? I didn't even have a chance to charge my radical. Oh, no, not the lab. So he takes out a communicator, and he's just like a din-din mushy, and he's like, hey, Usopp, are you okay? Come in. He's like, yeah, Frankie, we heard an explosion. What's going on? We're in the lab. Um, the other Vegapunks, Atlas, uh, Edison, and the Stella, the main Vegapunk, finally managed to crack the password. We don't find out what the password was. I kind of really wanted to know what it was. Maybe we'll find out next chapter or something. But they're like, we we did it, Quasar! We cracked the code! And York is like, ha, ah, damn you, Vegapunk. You're more of a genius than I originally assumed, even though I'm also Vegapunk and therefore also a genius. So I should have known. Whatever. So they're like kind of having a good moment here, but then uh, Frankie kind of explains the whole situation of like, okay, uh, Vega Force 1, the giant robot, yeah, that's gone, there's a problem with that, uh, but also we have a bigger issue, Kizaru is probably heading your way right now, and Vegapunk's like, wait, what now? And they just turn, and then Kizaru's just in the lab, he just, zip, he's just in the lab, because he can do that, he's made of fucking light, okay? So he's there, and he's just like, ah, yes, uh, you know, having you escape, Vegapunk, that's... That's not on today's menu. <laughs> okay, so it's like, oh man, there really is, there really is a level of like dread with Kizaru. Like, imagine that. Imagine a dude that can literally move that fast and just go anywhere he wants in the blink of an eye. Like, it, literally in a blink of an eye. Like, Usopp could be in the lab, and then Frankie could be like, Kizaru's coming, and then Usopp could literally look up. I don't see him, and then blink one time, and then just open his eyes, and Kizaru's just standing right in front of him. That's scary shit, okay? And so, Vegapunk's there, and he's like, oh no, Kizaru! And Kizaru's like, ah, sorry to break it to you, but your escape plan's not gonna work. That, that, uh, robot of dreams you built, it's blown to bits, so that's gone. And like, oh no! And then we have the final double page of the chapter, and oh man, is it a good one. All the Straw Hats, like, because remember, Brooke is there, Usopp's there, Nami's there, Edison, Atlas, they're all there. Uh, they can't really do anything. <laughs> they're kind of just like, ah. And Kizaru's just kind of looking down at Vegapunk, and he's just like, listen, Vegapunk. You gotta understand. You really gotta appreciate. This is a tough mission for me, too. I don't want to have to do this, and I don't want it to drag on too long, so... I can just, I'm, I'm ordered to eliminate you, I, I'll make it quick, there won't be any pain and suffering, but let's just get this over with. And before that can happen, Luffy appears, giant gear fifth Luffy appears, because remember there was no roof to the lab, it got cut off by uh, S. Hawk earlier and got blown up too. So all of a sudden Luffy just arrives and just reaches down and just picks up, grabs Kizaru like a damn action figure, so, here comes the giant fist!
It just keeps working. The SpongeBob, here comes the giant fist. It keeps becoming more applicable. It's the Kizaru action figure. <laughs> So he grabs Kizaru, and Luffy's there, and he's all charred. He's covered in, like, burns and shit, because he's just like, Oh, that's hot! I got knocked down through the laser grid twice! I had to come back! So Luffy literally got knocked through the laser grid in, in Snake Man, fell down, landed, I guess, in the fabrication sphere, and he's like, uh, Of course you know this means war. Come on, gear fifth time! And then he had to go through the laser grid again as a screaming giant gear fifth, and he lands, and he just like, ah. <laughs> Think you saw the last of me, huh? So, um... Um, that's badass. Luffy tanked the Frontier Tome twice. <laughs> Alright, that makes me feel bad for Bonnie. Like, is Bonnie gonna be okay? Because I think she got knocked into it too. Alright, so Kizaru is there and he's just like, Oh, it's finally, you're finally using that form. It's the fabled, you know, and he kind of trails off. And then Luffy's there and he just kind of says, you know, like, Oh, I thought I was gonna die. I got knocked through the grid twice, but I'm here now. It's time for the real fight to start Kizaru, right? Luffy's gonna have to be a little careful with this because, you know, they're in the lab right now, so um, Luffy can't just start pummeling the lab, so they're gonna have to get out of the lab, land on the ground outside around it. I still don't see any reason why Kizaru can't just zip and just like, get right out of the hand. He could probably just do that. Um, now, Gear 5th, though, here we go. Here's where the actual fight begins, and there's no break next week. No break next week, but... We have one more little scene before we leave, and we cut down back down to the junk heap where we were at earlier with the giant, I the iron giant, the giant iron giant. Yes, of course, um, the robot that attacked Marie Joie 200 years ago that uh, Kuma is following in its footsteps. Robots down there, it's all scrapped, and Vegapunk even mentioned, I have no idea how this thing runs, like the power source on this thing, nothing I've tried works. Um, I've tried, like, they, they basically reverse engineered Vega Force 1 using technology from the Iron Giant, but it's not the exact same thing. But, as Luffy goes into Gear 5th, and as the drums of liberation sound and resonate throughout Egghead, the eyes of the Iron Giant begin to glow, and it's like, begins to activate, okay? And so that's the end of the chapter. So, we, under, we understood, the idea that Oda's kind of going with here is the power of like some kind of mother flame or eternal flame. That's the sun. It's nuclear, uh, I guess, nuclear fusion, which is the actual thing the sun does. Uh, nuclear fission is the kind of like nuclear energy we have on our planet right now, like with nuclear power plants and stuff. But if we could harness nuclear fusion, like with the sun does, like our energy woes would just be gone, right? Luffy is the sun god. He has the, you know, Hito Hito no Mi model sun god Nika. So, if we're going along with this logic here, Luffy might really be radioactive. Luffy might be giving off nuclear fusion capabilities, okay? It was kind of up in the air if that, that's where the angle, you know, Oda wanted to go with it, but Kizaru's fighting Luffy. Kizaru's made of light and energy and lasers and shit. If Luffy really is the sun god in that respect, where he could harness some kind of, like, like raw sun power against Kizaru, then... Then you have a fight, my friend. By the way, we don't get any uh, update on Zoro fighting Luchi. I guess they're still fighting outside the lab or something. We have no updates on them this chapter. Um, but Luffy's there. He tanked the Frontier Dome twice. At least one of those times he was just in gear fourth, and then he came back up in gear fifth, I would assume. So Luffy's pretty scarred, and he's like, ah, that was hot. Ha, hot, hot. Anyway, <laughs> time to kick your ass. All right. So uh, I'm assuming the Iron Giant's going to power up, and it's probably going to seek out Luffy. It's probably going to directly go make a beeline line for Luffy, because that's where the power source is coming from, right? The drums of liberation are literally powering this thing up. So the plan can still work. Instead of using Vega Force 1, which was like a shittier version of the Iron Giant, you have the real thing now. The Iron Giant can activate and like must find drums of liberation, refuel, power cell, and then like try to get up to the Labosphere. This thing might be able to tank the Frontier Dome. This thing is like some ancient kingdom tech right here. So it might be able to zoop and then get shot with the Frontier Dome. Actually, they can turn it off now because they have the power of the, um, 
um, because they have the password, they could just crack it and turn the Frontier Dome off, which they might just do now, because what's the point of keeping it up? It's, it's honestly more of a hindrance now, if anything, um, you know, because Luffy got knocked through it twice, Bonnie got knocked through it, Kizuru can just zip through the damn thing whenever he wants, um, you know, I mean, I guess if you turn it off, that'll allow the Vice Admirals to get up very easily, but maybe turning it off might be the smarter thing to do. Turn off the Frontier Dome, uh, or they're, they're gonna have to evacuate anyway, because now we're gonna have a Gear 5th Luffy fight against Kizuru happening in the lab, Zoro and Luchi's happening outside, I mean, they're gonna have to escape the lab at some point, so turning off the Frontier Dome, that was part of the plan. They're like, okay, we're leaving the island anyway, turn off the dome, because we gotta get moving. The robot was destroyed. Yeah, I know, but we gotta figure something out. We gotta get going. We can't leave it all with the dome on, so they might just turn it off in the next chapter before they get the hell out of the lab, and then Luffy's fight can get underway with Kizuru. Um, so yeah, the Iron Giant might get up there then, he's like, oh, we have the giant. Okay, you know, Frankie, Frankie might be out there looking at the sunny and he's like oh man how am i gonna get the sunny all the way over there uh, i guess i could lift it up and get it upright and then i can use coup de burst but yeah, i don't know if the angle is gonna be right and then all of a sudden the iron giant is like i can assist and just like frankie's like Okay, other giant robot, I'm with it, let's go, super. You know, Frankie comes riding in on top of a giant robot as it's holding the sunny, like, let's get out of here. It's like, oh man. So, um, yeah, and the Iron Giant might even fight against Kizuru or something. It might be good at, it might be efficient at that too. The Straw Hats might just have the Iron Giant now as their companion. Oh my God, if Luffy asks the Iron Giant to join his crew. Oh my God, that is something that is very likely to happen. Imagine this, giant robot shows up. By the way, we don't know what the level of sentience this thing has, okay? It's ancient kingdom tech. This thing might have a mind of its own. It might be like, hello, joy boy, descendant. I am Iron Giant. I was tasked with protecting the ancient kingdom. My name is Fred. Luffy might just be like, you wanna join my crew? <laughs> He's like, if you would have me, that sounds fun. <laughs> just like, yeah. <laughs> might be a sentient robot. We don't know. Might be might be an actual iron giant. Like the actual. It's like you stay, I go. No following. God, that movie was so good. That movie was genuinely good. I hope they never make a sequel to it. I hope they don't ruin it. I hope they just keep it the way it is. That movie was genuine gold. All right. Huh. And this chapter was great too. So yeah, this is a One Piece chapter 1092. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of crazy stuff happening and there's no break next week. We're moving right along. Um, yeah. Later, bye. <laughs>